off a, a brand new series and be going through this series over the next several weeks. And uh, of course, the name of the series is uh, Grace is Greater. And so if you uh, have your handout, we're going to be following along on that this morning. And uh, hey, I just before we get into it, I thought I would mention uh, uh, we got a few folks uh, that are going to be having surgery this week, and so I just want to encourage you to be in prayer for those. We like to mention those as well, and so Sue Livick will be having a, a procedure tomorrow, an outpatient procedure tomorrow. I'm sure she'd appreciate you praying for her, and uh, Ronnie uh, Bradbury has one coming up on Tuesday, and Gwen Whitmore on Wednesday, so we got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday covered. And I'm sure y'all know of others, but just encourage you to be in prayer for our, our church family and, and those that are uh, going to be having surgery. Um, but hey, as we get ready to kick off this uh, new series called Grace is Greater, uh, I, I don't know about you, but at the beginning of every year, uh, I've got a few things that I really love to do. The list, as far as I know, I haven't uh, seen it yet. I, I subscribe to a couple of those weird internet things that send you those weird articles or whatever. But I love getting the, like, the new words that come out in the dictionary. You know, like, they've not been a part of our dictionary before, but they're like brand new words that have just been added. And uh, I like to look at them and see, you know, before I actually, like, look at the meaning of the word, I actually like to look at them and see if I can kind of figure it out, which sometimes is a far, far fetch. But anyway, we're going to look at a few new words this morning. I just want to show you a few. And uh, I promise you these may not be necessarily in an academic dictionary, but they are in a dictionary nevertheless. So let's take a look at them, and uh, I, here's what I'd like you to do. See if you can maybe guess the word or maybe try to figure out a way to fit these into your vocabulary uh, this coming week. And uh, here's the first word. The first word is, bring that next slide up, Larry, phonesis. Phonesis. Now, the first time I heard that word or read that word, I thought, okay, so this must be absent-mindedly setting your phone down somewhere and constantly forgetting where you put it. This would fit Melissa. She can never find her cell phone. So I said, Melissa suffers from phonesis. But that's actually not it at all, believe it or not. Um, here, here is the definition for Phonesis, it is the act of dialing a phone number and then forgetting who you were calling just as they answer. You ever done that? Yeah, yeah. So the next time you pick up the phone to call somebody, and I mean, like, I've even committed to make the phone call and then realized I really didn't want to talk to them. So the next time that they answer, just say, hey, I'm suffering from some phonesis and my bad. I'll talk to you later. Um, but, but anyway, um, you know, hey, here's the next one. Uh, this one is called um, dis, disconfect, disconfect, okay, disconfect. And this one's kind of interesting. You would use this one around Halloween time, especially if you had young children in your house. Just a thought. Um, it is, um, it, it's an interesting word. It is a verb, and here's the definition. It is the attempt to sterilize a piece of candy that you dropped on the floor by blowing on it. You ever? Done, I mean, you know, like the ten-second rule. Only they put a word, uh, put a name to it. You know, like pick it up and go. You know, that's disconfect. So the next time you see, you know, like your kids or grandkids, and, and they say, "Well, mom, dad, I'm just disconfecting my candy." I mean, they've got this thing down pat. Um, anyway. Uh, the next word is blame storming. Blame storming. This one is used in the corporate setting. So instead of brainstorming, it's blame storming. And, and here's the definition for it it's sitting in a group and discussing who's responsible for the company's problems rather than trying to solve them. Does, does this sound right? Yeah. They've had to come up with a name for that, right? So we, we sit around, and instead of trying to fix the problem, we figure out who's to blame for the problem to begin with. And here's another one for you, and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate this one, especially right here this time of year. We're getting into tax season, as Harry just reminded me the other day. Intoxication. 
And uh, this one was pretty interesting. I, I really love this one probably more than all of them. And the definition for intoxication is, it is the utopia from getting a tax refund, which lasts until you realize that it was your money to begin with. You know, so you get all excited. You're like, yes, I got a great refund. And then you realize it's your money anyway. So what are you getting excited about? Anyway, so, I mean, this exciting, you know, thing of, Learning new words, seeing new words, realizing new words can be kind of fun, can be kind of exciting. But I think something that happens is when we, when we become familiar with words, familiar with their meanings, we tend to overlook them. Would you agree with that? When we become familiar with our words, we tend to overlook them. We tend to use them without thinking about them. We assume understanding because they've been around for a long time. We've been using them for a long time. They sit on the shelf, sure, but we know that word. And, and, uh, and, and so over the next four weeks as we enter into this series, I want to encourage you to approach uh, this word that we're going to be talking about as if you've never heard it before. Uh, several years ago, Kellogg's Corn Flakes developed a... Uh, a, a commercial, and this is serious, they must have done some marketing and research and they determined that majority of people had bought uh, cornflakes and tried them as a kid, but uh, so at some point in time they, they quit eating them. And so their, their franchise phrase for trying to reconnect people with Kellogg's was, taste them again for the first time. I thought that was kind of interesting. So I, I want you to taste this word again for the first time. I, I want you to approach it as if you've never heard it. And that word is grace. We're going to be talking over the next four weeks about this magnificent thing called grace. God's wondrous grace. And, and, and I, I'll just be honest with you. I think we tend to, to miss it because we, we've, we've said this word so many times. It's something that rolls off of our tongue. We sing songs about it. We, we talk about it so easily. But the Bible says this in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, and I want us to look at the first part of this verse. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And, and, and it's been my prayer as a pastor, especially as of late, that no one would miss the grace of God because it, what a tragedy it would be to come to church, to be a part of a community, and somehow manage to miss the grace of God. And, and, and I think you can miss a lot of things, but I really want to encourage you not to miss this. Don't miss the grace of God because as you're going to see and as you continue to read in this passage of Scripture that things turn toxic when we miss the grace of God. So if we're going to understand this like we're hearing it for the first time, I want us to look at several things. I don't think that we can talk about the grace of God without talking about sin. I, I don't know how people... Uh, churches can talk about Jesus Christ as Savior and, and Lord and, and it mean anything unless we first talk about our sin and our need for a Savior. I don't think we can talk about the grace of God unless we talk about our sin condition and our need for God's grace. And the Bible is pretty clear about our sin condition and we're going to look at that this morning. And, and, and it starts out pretty clear. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that everyone has sinned. We all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. I, I, I love that passage of Scripture in the, in the New Living Translation because it says God's glorious standard. Everyone, everyone. Who falls under the heading of everyone? We all do, right? I do, you do, we all do, right? It's a problem that we all face. And, 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 and I know you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, well, hey, I've sinned, but I've not sinned. I've not sinned sin. I, I'm, I'm not as bad as maybe that person over there. Uh, have you watched reality TV and seen some of the crazy things on, on reality TV lately? I'm nowhere near as bad as they are. Well, let me encourage you to stop there because you're comparing yourself to somebody else and you're probably falling in a category of sin. 
We have to be careful. Brother Billy just went through this series about comparing. Your your that you're sinning, that's pride, that's self-righteousness, that's look at me. And 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 scripture goes on to say that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's it's a sin, it's it's a sickness, it's a virus. And and I told the teens last week it's it's a congenital virus, meaning that it's passed down from generation to generation to generation. It's something that we all deal with. And we all have this problem because we don't like to admit that we're sick, do we? None of us do. Uh, Melissa's always after me. She's like, are, are, you, are you getting sick? No, I'm not sick. Uh, it, but you, you don't look great. You're sniffing, you're coughing, you need some cough syrup. No, I don't need no cough syrup. I'm not sick. <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I really think you need to take something. You would feel better. You would sleep better. She's translated, she would sleep better. But, I mean, you would sleep better if you would just take something. No, I'm not sick. Because if I admit that I'm sick, then I have to change some things, right? We've all got our schedules. We've all got things that we're doing. We're all busy people. And if we admit that we're sick, then we've got to change something to address that, to fix that. And that's no way to, uh, to pretend that we're sick, as it turns out, is not an effective way to get better, guys. We have to acknowledge that we're sick in order to get better, don't we? We have to acknowledge it, fix it. And grace is a cure, a a as an antidote, means nothing if people don't recognize their own sickness. The Bible says that we've all sinned. It says everyone, that's true for everyone, that's the diagnosis. And it gives us a prognosis of, uh, a few chapters over. And this is what it says. It says that the wages for our sin is death. Bottom line, everyone has sinned, and the, doc, the prognosis for that is death. I, I mean, if you were uh, reading articles a few years ago, this was a big thing. Everybody's heard of the Zika virus, right? You know, and there was, there was some studies of what would happen if the Zika virus ever landed in the United States, that it would be horrible, right? I mean, it would be widespread, it would, it would be disastrous. Well, if we look at sin in that light, that's exactly what's happened. It, it originated from one host, carried through, and it was devastating to us all. I want us to look at a few passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. Adam's sin brought death, and so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. You see, it all started with Adam, therefore, everyone has this infection, everyone has uh, death coming, we've all been diagnosed, and, and, but then we introduced this idea of grace, this antidote for our infection, this virus that we all carry. And, and I love this word that we're fixing to see in these next several passages. It says, but. But. Man, that's a, that is a grace-filled word. But, but there is a difference, Romans chapter 5, verse 15. There is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many, but, there it is again, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So essentially what Paul is saying here is he says, hey, he says sin is powerful, but God's grace is greater. Did you catch that? Sin is powerful, but God's grace is greater. Now, I've had a couple of kids come through high school, one graduate, and the same thing is true with Breeze as it was with Cody. Breeze brings home math homework every once in a while, not very often, but she'll bring home her math homework and she'll carry it in and she'll say, hey, Dad, look at this. And I'll say, go see your mom. <laughs> Which Melissa says, thanks for throwing me under the bus. Um, but, I mean, it makes no sense to me. It might as well be a foreign language. I was really good at basic elementary math, like greater than and less than. You know, like, that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty straight on. And, 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 and greater than, less than, it was easy to come... To, and when it comes to God's grace, there's a greater than and there's a less than. And that's the equation that Paul is getting to here in Romans chapter 5. He says grace is greater than, and you fill in the blank. You fill in the blank. Whatever, anything, 
everything. Whatever you want to put on the other side of that equation, God's grace is greater than it. When it comes to uh, sin in our head, or whether it's a mistake that we've made, it's a secret that we're trying to hide, it's grace is greater than that whether it's a season of our life that we're trying to pretend never happened, God is greater than that. When we understand the greatness of God's grace, it it, it makes all the difference. It gives us freedom. It gives us hope that is greater than. No matter what you've done, no matter uh, how severe the infection, how debilitating the pain of your sin, grace is greater than that. God's grace is greater. Verse 16 says this. I I love it. It says the results of God's gracious gift are very different than the result of one man's sin. It says as the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to the condemnation but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God. I miss Emery being here because he'd be over there going like, Amen brother! Because it is, it, is, it is Christ's gift that leads to us being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Amen. It is the, it is the gift of God. That, that passage of Scripture, the, for the wages of sin is death, but, I love that word but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 17 goes on to say, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused the death, caused death to rule over many, but, but, there's that word but, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and His righteousness to all who receive it. You see, for all of us who receive faith through Jesus Christ, we have, we have triumph over sin. Yes, Adam's sin brought condemnation for everyone, but Christ's righteous act on the cross brings relationship with God and and, and newness. And this is what grace does for us. It brings right relationship for uh, it brings right relationship with God for everyone who receives it. And don't miss this; you can miss a lot. But God's grace is greater than your sin. And it gives you new life. It gives you a second chance. But sometimes, I think, sometimes grace gets missed. And the church sometimes doesn't do a great job of communicating that. And, and we miss it. And, and uh, you know what it's, do you know what it's called talking about God's, God and leaving out grace? Do you know what they call that? It's called Religion. And, and, and you may not expect to hear that, and you may not expect to hear what you're supposed to hear, but as a pastor, as a preacher, I don't really like religion. I'm not a big fan of organized religion, and I don't think Jesus was either. I mean, look at Matthew chapter 23, if you want to read and see what Jesus had to say uh, about religion. But when, when, when religion is what you're left with, it takes grace totally out of the equation. And religion is not greater than your sin. Religion is not greater than your sin. It won't save you. And here's how we can define religion. I put this up. Religion is our attempt. It's man's attempt. It's our attempt to earn God's favor by adhering to some rules and regulations. It's our attempt to balance the scales, like, hey, I'm going to go do this, and so I need to do this to kind of counteract and counter, counterbalance what's going on here. I can be good enough to balance out the scale. My religious good deeds and acts can be good enough to equal the equation of the favor in my, uh, in my favor. It, my good deeds can balance out the equation here, and my good favor can make up the difference. And I hate to tell you, but that is wrong. Because religion is not greater than your sins. It's not an effective way to deal with our sin problem. So I came up with a a list here this morning. And if you're going to follow along on your handout, I I left some blank spaces there for you. But I wanted us to take a parallel look at religion and grace. Religion and grace. And we're going to go down through these pretty quick. First of all, uh, the key word for religion is do. 
It's all about what I can do. It's, it's working hard enough, maybe I'll make the cut. And if I work hard enough, if I get out and serve hard enough, if I, if I, if I give hard enough, if I, if I put up the right uh, effort, it's going to get me into heaven. It's going to earn me eternity. Whereas grace is what's been done. It is recognizing the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's what's been done for us, not by us. Secondly, the focus of religion, and this one I think is, is a big one, is outwardly. You, you, constantly, you constantly see Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, you constantly see Jesus uh, after criticizing the religious elite of his day. I mean, he would say things like, hey, you honor me with your lips, uh, you say all the right things, you put on the right acts, but your heart is far from me. Or, or he would say things like, yeah, you, you look religious, you look good on the outside, you're wearing the right things, you're wearing the religious garb, but on the inside, you're like a tomb of dead men's bones. On Sunday night, I said, what, I challenged the church in the message on Sunday night. I said, what would it be like to serve God your whole life and at the end of your life have Him say, depart from me for I never knew you? We can do that with religion. We can act religious. But the focus is on the heart. It's all about transformation and change from the inside out. Thirdly, the, the foundation of religion is rules. It, it's, uh, typically, this typically happens in religion, and then we, uh, we come up with a list of rules. We call this legalism. We, we begin to impose a whole list of, of rules beyond the Bible. We say, hey, well, if you want to be a good Christian, you can not only follow the Bible, but you can follow our rules too. Right? And so we come up with this list of if you want to be a good Christian, if you want to be a good follower of Jesus, here's what you've got to do. And, 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 and so it, t it tends to be based on rules and re uh, re legalism. Meanwhile, grace is based on relationship. It's based on our relationship with God. And it's not up in the air every time we make a mistake or every time we sin. It's based upon our relationship with God. Next, the, the motivation. The motivation for religion is shame. People try to control us by making us feel bad. And, and a lot of you here may say, well, hey, I mean, I grew up in that kind of church, and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if that's the approach. And I believe, yes, there is conviction. There's conviction by the Holy Spirit when we're not doing something right, when we need to change. But I don't know that shame is the right way. I don't know that that was Jesus' way of dealing with it. When there's conviction without the gospel, conviction without the good news, conviction without the cure, conviction without grace, that's religion. And religion uses shame to control us. On the other hand, we have the motivation for grace, and that's gratitude. Where we live in recognition of, what, of what's been done for us and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for each one of us, and it's our gratitude that motivates us to live holy and motivates us to live a life honoring and pleasing to God. And, and motivation, or uh, I'm sorry, religion leaves us feeling uh, fear and um, frustration. Fear of condemnation makes you say, man, I, 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 uh, if Jesus came back right now, I wouldn't make it. It's all about me. Now, if I if I happen if I just so happen to be lucky enough to make it into heaven, this is what I'm going to do when I get there. If I'm lucky enough to squeeze by, this is what I'm going to do because we're basing it upon our religious acts. If I'm good enough, if I read my Bible enough, if I pray enough, if I go to church enough, if I give enough, it leaves that fear and that frustration of constantly wondering, am I doing enough? Whereas through grace we find freedom in Christ. We find freedom in the goodness of Christ. You feel free from the pressure of measuring up because it's already been taken care of on the cross. And the outcome of religion winds up either being pride or guilt. 
Because either you sit around and, and, and you feel proud, look at what I've done, or self-righteous, because thinking, well, man, I, I followed all the rules, I did everything right, uh, look at me, I, I've done it right. Or you're constantly feeling guilty, thinking, man, I just never measured up. I messed up again. Meanwhile, the outcome of grace is love. Because the Bible says that we love God because He first loved us. When we focus our grace, when we focus on His grace in our lives, we experience from the bottom, uh, we experience His love, what He did for us. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Bottom line is, let's bring up that next part grace is greater than religion. Grace is greater than religion. Grace is what we need. But I think to truly understand this antidote called grace, you can't just listen to me. I've grown to understand this more and more, that to understand grace is not by explanation, it's by experience. And that's what's so frustrating as a pastor, as a communicator, and as a preacher. Because I can sit and tell you all day long, God's grace is this, God's grace is this, but until you experience it for yourself, you're going to always be missing that part. I, I love the way that E.B. E. White put it. He says, grace can be dissected like a frog, but the thing dies in the process. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, you can, we can take the academic approach. I could go get you some academic theological textbooks off my shelf in my office and, and we can talk uh, grace to death. And we can try and explain it. And, and I think those are good things to do. I think it's good to be able to do it. But the power of grace has to be experienced. The more we dissect it, every way we dissect it, the frog dies. And we can dissect grace apart. Everything, an explanation does not do enough. And I believe that's why we have to look to the Gospels to see stories. I, I didn't put this up on the screen, but if you want to turn there, I, I'm not going to read all those passages this morning, but John chapter 8 is a great story uh, of, of God's, of God, of this, uh, Incredible thing called grace because Jesus is teaching in this courtyard early one morning. And we don't know really what he's teaching about, but we know it's pretty good because people have gotten out of bed early. They've begun to congregate around him to see what's going on. There's no indication that it's daylight savings time weekend or anything like that. It just seems like people wanted to hear him. So they begin to gather around Jesus to see what he was teaching about. And, and all of a sudden, this mob comes busting in as Jesus is teaching teaching and they're dragging a half-naked woman probably wrapped in a bed sheet. And the attention quickly shifts off of Jesus and it shifts onto this mob and onto this woman. And, and they begin to come in and the, the mob shoves her to the ground in front of Jesus and one of the spiritual leaders looks at Jesus and says, and this is from John chapter 8 verses 4 and 5, he says, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law tells us to stone such a woman. What do you say? And, and at first, Jesus didn't say anything because Jesus knew that it was a trap. But I, I love Jesus' approach because he bends down and he starts to write in the dirt with his fingers. Now, nobody really knows what he was writing. I've, I've, some speculate that he was writing the sins of her accusers. You know, like, man, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? That Jesus was actually listing their sin in the sand. One religious leader said, Jesus, what do we do? What should we do? And Jesus stands up and he looks and says, let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And he goes back to writing in the dirt. Slowly, he hears all these stones begin to fall <laughs> to the ground. I imagine that was a pretty powerful sound. Clang, 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 clang. And he looks up. And, and he looks up at this woman but his eyes were not full of condemnation or judgment. And he says to her, he says, where are your accusers? Is there no one left to condemn you? You see, you've got to understand, Jesus knows this woman. 
He, he's known her since she was knitted together in her mother's womb. He knows the number of hair on her heads. He's, he's kept her tears in a, in, in a bottle in heaven since the day she was born. Jesus knows her. This is his daughter. And he says, is there no one left to condemn you? But then he says, neither do I. Go now and sin no more. You see, this is guilt. This is sin. She was caught in the act. The door was ripped open. She was pulled from the bed in the act. According to this passage, these passages of Scripture, there's no question of her guilt. This is the worst day of, the, of her life. The darkest secret of her life has been exposed. And yet here is this beautiful truth because the worst day of her life becomes the best day of her life because in her brokenness she meets Jesus. And here's something that we can all learn and understand and take away, and that is this, that God's grace is greater than our secrets, than our secret, whatever that might be. I think this woman's worst fear would be that someone would find out, and I think we can all understand that. After all, we all kind of keep these secrets maybe in our lives, don't we? We live in denial of our lust or our pride or our greed or our selfishness and we want to keep that secret to ourselves maybe by comparing ourselves to others or what others have done. But here's something to think about. Your secret is making you sick. You may think the worst thing that could happen would be somebody would find out your secret. Oh man, what if so and so found out this secret? But God's grace is greater than your secret. You don't know it until it's brought from the dark and into the light. But when it's exposed, there's this beautiful truth. We're met with this beautiful truth. And that is that God's grace is greater than our secret. And that means you may have to drag it out of the darkness and into the light, kicking and screaming. It's not going to come easy. It doesn't want to be exposed. But listen to me, church. You don't have to live with it. It doesn't mean you've got to come up here and stand up in front of everybody and begin to list off your sin. I'm not asking you to do that. But God knows us. He knows us individually. He just wants us to welcome Him in and into that part that we gate off. Because God's grace is greater than our sin. I'm going to try and run down through these real quick. I'm running out of time. But I want you to see these. There's this series of books called Post Secrets. There's eight of these books out. I would not recommend them. And Larry, that was bad timing, brother. <laughs> Horrible timing. <laughs> right, let, me, let, me, let me preface what that means that this popped up. Women, don't come beat me down because it said if you don't wear makeup, you're lazy. But I would not recommend these books. They're pretty dark. Um, but, but there was this guy named Frank Warren. He wrote these books. Not now either! <laughs> he printed thousands of these postcards and he threw them out. And this is what he said on the postcards. Not now. Not now! He says, you're invited to anonymously, anonymously contribute to a secret art project. And he says, reveal anything as you want, anything you want as long as it's a secret and as long as you've never shared it with anyone. And then what he did is he left these cards in public spaces with pencils and he challenged people to write any secret that they wanted, mail them in to him, and then he took them, compiled them, and he's written eight books. Some of them are trivial, dumb stuff. Some of them are pretty deep. I just wanted to give you a cross-the-board example. Now, Larry, I think women who don't wear makeup are lazy. I'm thinking, really? That's dumb. You're going to share a secret? That, that's your secret? Get a life. Uh, next one. Yeah, come on. Come on. When I'm mad at my husband, I put boogers in his soup. <laughs> I got a revolt going on back in the sound room. But anyway, moving on. <clears throat> Melissa, I'd kill you. Um <clears throat> <laughs> and that's for we're having soup for lunch oh man I should have thought that through <clears throat> next <clears throat> moving on moving on I'm afraid of women who wear capri pants I, I don't even get that um, every time let's, let's check out every time I get my toenails done I want to kick the girl in the face that's doing them wow uh, alright bring up this next one 
I hate people who include me in a group text message. I can understand that. I, I'm really not a fan. Let's look at this next one. I give decaf to the customers who are rude to me. Uh, but m many of the secrets are, are really sad. Let's look at this next one. I wish my father had forgiven me while he was still alive. Or sometimes I wish I was blind so I wouldn't have to look myself look at myself in the mirror. Let's look at this next one. My husband doesn't know he's raising his best friend's child. When I sleep with my wife, I feel unfaithful to my lover. I haven't spoken to my dad in 10 years and it kills me every day. When I eat, it feel, I feel like a failure. I'm only happy when I buy things. And hold on just one second, Larry. This last one I left on purpose. I just wanted to share with you an across-the-board kind of look at things that people send in. Because this last one kind of, kind of got me, and I just want to challenge you with it. I, I told my secrets, and now I feel free. But there's really no freedom without grace. There really is no freedom without grace. You, when you finally confess and finally repent, you'll discover the most beautiful thing, and that is that the secrets you've kept inside will make you sick and contaminate your relationship with other people and God. Despite how terrible you'll feel, you'll discover that through Jesus Christ, God's grace is greater than your secrets. And God's grace is greater than our shame. You see, Jesus was left alone with this woman who was, you would imagine, she's humiliated, she's ashamed. And he said to her, I don't condemn you either. Leave, go, and sin no more. He gives her a second chance. He gives her a fresh start. He says, now go and live a new life in me. And you see, I see this being a problem for Christians even today. You may be sitting here saying, but hey, I'm a Christian and this doesn't apply to me. But I, I, think, I think there's a problem with Christians too because we've, we've experienced forgiveness and, and, and maybe you've received grace, but you don't live in it. You continue to feel guilt and shame for things you've done instead of living in joy and peace instead of living in the joy and peace of God's grace. And, and some of that's on the church, because the church does this fantastic job of holding things over our head, which I don't think we should. But there is freedom in Christ. Because grace is greater than our sin, and grace is greater than religion. Grace is greater than our secrets. God, uh, grace is greater than our shame. Grace is greater than your guilt. And you don't have to carry that around. Give that to Christ and find freedom in Him. Don't be bound by the chains of guilt. Don't be shackled. Drag along these burdens. Turn them over to Jesus and find freedom in Him. And I believe it's my prayer that we all encounter God's grace when we experience it. Let's pray. So I just want to challenge you real quick just before we get ready to pray. We're kicking off a new series this morning. We're going to be talking about this word grace over the next uh, four or five weeks. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced God's grace and this is a totally new word for you. And yet, maybe you're here this morning and, 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 and it's a word you're familiar with and the challenge to uh, forget what you've known and experience anew in Jesus is resonating in your ears this morning. I just want to challenge you now to uh, begin to experience anew the grace found in relationship with God. And if you don't know Jesus as Lord, let me challenge you to start there first. I'll be up front. Um, I just challenge you to see me or see one of our deacons and take care of that first because there is freedom in Jesus.
And if you're here this morning and you're shackled by the, uh, the, the chains of, of, of sin or, or religion, that you've been trying to live this religious life and, or, or you're burdened by secrets you're trying to live or shame or maybe even guilt, I pray that you could find newness and, and freedom in Jesus today. Just before I get ready to pray, if you would be here this morning, just say, hey, pastor, uh, just, just, just pray for me this morning. God, God knows I'm not going to come run you down, but I, I, I just, I'd love to just pray for some folks this morning. Maybe, maybe you would say, hey, this doesn't have anything to do with that, or maybe it is. Maybe, maybe you're bound by one of these things. Just want me to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Would you slip your hand up and just say, pastor, pray for me this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, and as we were reminded this morning, of the goodness of your grace. Father, I pray over the next four weeks that you would just challenge us, refresh us, bring anew to the reminder of this word grace. Father, I pray that we would find freedom in you. Father, if there's one here today that is bound by the chains of sin or weighted down by their religious acts like, you know, I'm trying to live a certain way or uh, do a certain thing to earn your favor or there's one here today bound by the, the secrets that they're trying to carry around or, or, or uh, eat up with, with shame and guilt, that, Father, I pray that there could be freedom found in you. Father, as we get ready to leave this place, I pray you help us, Father, to live for you in a world that so desperately, desperately needs to see you. We ask and pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have uh, announcements? No. no. No announcements. Hey, just a quick reminder, uh, 6 p.m. service tonight. Dan Fay will be speaking tonight, and that should be good. Look forward to hearing from what Dan, what the Lord's laid on Dan's heart. Uh, also, uh, don't forget.